Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Roslansky, head of product at LinkedIn, and I'm excited to welcome you here today. At LinkedIn, we focus on getting professionals access to the knowledge and insights they need to be better at their jobs. Every day, there's millions of conversations happening across our platform. Today, I'm really excited to bring one of those conversations to you live and in person for an on-the-record discussion about a topic that's been trending recently on LinkedIn. We have Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn and partner at Greylock, along with Tim O'Reilly, the co-founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, as well as the author of an upcoming book, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us, which will be coming out shortly. They're gonna be talking about the discussions and the differing opinions they've been having about how companies should scale and fundraise. We're gonna dig into that today. We're also super fortunate to have John Fort, the co-anchor of CNBC's Squawk Alley, here to moderate the discussion. The discussion will also be live streamed on CNBC.com. We're very grateful for our partnership with John and CNBC as always. The discussion will last about 30 minutes. And if you'd like to share the discussion with your network, please feel free to do so using hashtag in debate. And without much further ado, please join me in welcoming John Reed and Tim to the stage for the discussion. Oh my goodness, right. we are three chairs, so you're gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand up the whole time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Really? yeah. I sit all day during, oh. you know, during the, the show at show. CNBC, yeah, yeah. so I, I'm do some standing. Uh, and, and to decide who's going to get the first question, we will have a coin toss. You co founded LinkedIn and we're at LinkedIn, so you are the visiting captain. So, Tim, you get to call it in the air heads or tails? All right. Tails. It is heads. All right. Reed gets the first question. More formal than we're used to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna have a debate, I yes, think we might as well we might as well actually do it. All right, we will cover three topics related to scale uh, in this debate. We will cover uh, the power of scale, the money involved, and jobs. We'll start with power. Uh, Reed, you sold LinkedIn to Microsoft. I think we're about. $26 billion last year for scale reasons in part after building a huge public company. Doesn't that in a way undermine your argument? Even big enough isn't big enough. Um, not per, te, per se, actually. In fact, it may be a support of it because the key question in a network world is especially amongst technology businesses and, and you know, I think one of the questions is that all businesses are on path to becoming technology businesses. But amongst technology businesses, you tend to get to a what's the platform, what's the standard, uh, what's the, the marketplace that, that derives this particular good. And so as part of thinking about kind of this question about making decisions about scale, because um, you know, not all businesses are huge scale, and there's a lot of very good businesses that will cover that. But around, especially around technology businesses, it tends to be uh, a little bit of the Glen Gary, Glen Ross, right? First prize is Cadillac, second prize is steak knives, and third prize is your fire. <laughs> and so uh, you definitely want the Cadillac, right? The steak knives are, right. a, are, 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 are a secondary proposition. And so the, the way that you, you essentially look at this is you say, okay, do I have that chance, and it could be a low probability of a high outcome, but do I have that chance of creating that platform, of creating something that's interesting. And in the LinkedIn and Microsoft case, it was not only be transformative to careers and opportunities, but be transformative to daily work. And that was part of the scale uh, theory in the combination. All right, uh, to let you know a little bit about the format, I failed to do this up front. You'll have two minutes to make your case after the question, and the other person will have one minute to respond. So Tim, your response. Yeah. Uh, first off, I would say uh, I agree with Reed that there are opportunities that require internet scale. Uh, but look around. How many internet scale companies are there that are really, really successful? And how many companies do we need? If we're really trying to build a robust economy, uh, we can't just have a couple of giant internet scale companies. And one of the problems, I think, with the dominant Silicon Valley narrative uh, is that every entrepreneur should be going for the brass ring. And the point is, most of them will fail. Even those who succeed will probably give up 
most of the control and most of the profits, uh, the most of the value in their companies to their investors. 15 seconds. Meanwhile, there's a huge opportunity, which my partner Bryce has uh, captured with, this, uh, with our venture firm uh, with this project called IndyVC, which is build companies that can live forever because they're living on revenue from their customers at whatever scale they are. All right. They're dependent on investors. Uh, Tim, next question to you. In a world where scaled businesses are taking even greater share of the economy and where companies need to develop software, for instance, often to, to compete, isn't scale actually more crucial than ever for everyone? The point is that everyone doesn't get that scale. It's the responsibility of platforms to provide scale to others. So here's a great example away from tech. Uh, you know, we, we're very wrapped up in tech, but I, I recently became fascinated by Alexis Madrigal's Containers podcast, which is about container shipping. And episode four is about the coffee market. And he talks about one of our local uh, roasters, uh, Ritual Coffee Roasters. And they have single origin coffees from all over the world. They're, you know, different kinds of roasts. It's a real artisanal business. Now, it's a, not a scale business. They got, you know, it's a reasonable size business. They're supported by an importer that's large for private importers, but private company called Royal Coffee. Royal Coffee imports about 1.5 million uh, pounds of coffee a week. Uh, but there are companies, huge conglomerates, 60, 70, 100 billion dollar companies in this container shipping business that are the platform that means that that small grower in Guatemala and ritual coffee roasters can both have a good business. And that's also what we should be looking for from a Google, from a Facebook, from a LinkedIn and Microsoft combination, that it is an enabler of our broader economy. It is what we should be looking for from our financial system. And that's a lot of what I get to in my book. What are the lessons from technology uh, uh, that apply to our thinking about the economy? You know, I started my, my business uh, you know, competing in the marketplace of ideas with open source software against proprietary software in the days of, of Microsoft's ascendance. And what I learned was that if you take too much value, your developers desert you. And that's what happened to Microsoft. They, you know, Microsoft said, well, we're going to have to just take that market. And eventually, all developers went over the internet where they could still find new opportunity. They went to open source. And meanwhile, the open source seconds, market was just about, hey, we want to create value. And that's really my motto at O'Reilly Media, create more value than you capture. And right. that should be the goal of every platform. Read your response. Uh, so broadly agree on the value of platforms and platforms creating good businesses, open platforms uh, like the internet, uh, uh, hugely valuable. I would say that one of the key things to kind of amplify is trends, is while Tim and I agree that there is a huge value in a bunch of small businesses and there's a reason to create those on top of these platforms, whether it's like Airbnb and hosts or whether it's you know, kind of enabling businesses on LinkedIn or other kinds of things and that the responsibility of these platforms is to do that. When you're creating tech businesses in a networked world where the whole world has become local and small, there's much more of, a, of, of the kind of the competition for if the business is gonna be large, it's the, there's gonna be primarily a dominant player like a kind of a winner takes most, just out of the, of the, of the artifact that it's a networked world as part of it. It's not actually anything, any misbehavior uh, on any of the companies. 10 seconds. And so I think the key thing when you're thinking about this as a tech business is to say, okay, do I need to blitz scale for that? And then the second part of it is more businesses are becoming tech businesses. Like if you see the trend in businesses, technology is a more and more important part of more of them. Um, thank you, gentlemen. That concludes the power section, we're gonna move on to money, which is interesting because part of the inspiration, really, for this debate was an episode of Reed's podcast, Masters of Scale, that was really largely about money. How much money should startups raise uh, in order to have the best chance of achieving their vision? Should they be super frugal and just try to get by on cash flow, or should they raise basically as much money as they can get and prepare for the unforeseen. And since we're plugging podcasts, Mind Fort Knox uh, is also available. Uh, rich ideas and powerful people. The next guest is going to be Reed Hoffman. We'll be recording an episode uh, right after this. Um, just a little plug there. So Tim, the first question to you on the topic of money. 
Reed argues that tech businesses are a special breed that need money to stay nimble and outlast rivals. In Masters of Scale, episode two, he made a reasonably specific case. Why is he wrong? I think the first reason that Reed is wrong is that <laughs> it's <laughs> very, <laughs> and there's quite a few. But, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, all right. First of all, this is a game, it is a horse race, right? By definition, one or two players wins, and all the rest of them lose. So people are working, uh, looking for that hit. Meanwhile, there are many, many businesses, and I, I think of, of my own business, which is a couple hundred million dollars in revenue. Uh, we, we started with $500. We grew it organically. Our customers funded us. And there are way more of those businesses uh, than you think. Uh, in fact, uh, Bryce, uh, my partner, who's sitting here in the front row, uh, made the point that uh, in the second half of 2016, there were nine big exits. Uh, you know, two pub companies went public. Uh, seven uh, were sort of multi-billion dollar sales. Of that seven, three of them were self-funded, right? And that's kind of astonishing because the, the mythology is you have to raise huge amounts of money in order to get the scale. But it's also possible for small companies to get the scale if you, if you play your cards right and if you're serving real customers. The, the second reason uh, is that... My read is wrong. Uh, the second reason my <laughs> read is wrong is that if you match, if, if you play the blitz scaling game in a business that does not actually have the opportunity for scale. Now take my business. You know, the total market size, when I started my business, uh, it was actually a consulting business, which became a publishing business, which became an on, uh, a conference business, which became an online learning company. We kind of pivoted, you know, we've been around for, for 40 years. But when we thought of ourselves as a publisher, you know, the total market size of computer book publishing was about three or $400 million, right? So the whole seconds. universe wasn't that big, you know? Uh, and so the scale, you got to think about the scale of the market you're trying to tackle before you, uh, you know, go and raise lots of money. All right, read your response. So three things. One, um, actually, frequently there is true that only a few win, but actually, of the others, frequently they get purchased. So those intermediate exits aren't kind of completely loser, and that's part of the the strategy you do as an entrepreneur and also as an investor. Uh, the second is part of the reason why you want to tend to raise a bunch of capital is not just to um, essentially realize the opportunity, but it also has a kind of a competitive dimension. And I think Tim is correct that there's some areas where that will just cause you to fail. Um, but the question is, is if you're competing against someone else who has raised blitz capital as a way of doing it, the likelihood is either they're gonna win or you're both gonna lose. And so you're guaranteed on a lose-lose thing, and so that's one of the reasons once it's gone to that level, you have to competitively match it. 15 seconds. And then the third thing I would say in, in, in honor and, and deference to Tim is, um, who has done an amazing job with a set of businesses and with NDVC and everything else, is that maybe Global Network Navigator, if you'd raised capital, might have actually been a much higher outcome. I, I will totally fired. agree with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the next question under money goes to you, Reed. Uh, Brian Chesky, co-founder of Airbnb, warns on your podcast that raising too much money can lose you control of your business or lead to prodigal spending habits? So there are problems with raising a bunch of money. It can raise your burn rate over your skis where the market doesn't develop fast enough. That was the, pin, the, the thing that Tim was referring to. It can also lose your psychological discipline and even, you, you know, you kind of, their money's there so you spend it, both of which are kind of classic mistakes. And those are things that if you do raise a bunch of money, you have to be very careful about. But as I was mentioning in my last remark, Part of the really key thing about um, raising a bunch of money, and by the way, Airbnb has raised a bunch of money, uh, is, and I love Brian, and I think he's being very choiceful, and he's talking about the early phase versus the scale phase. In the early phase, you have to be uh, uh, extra cautious, is that essentially there's lots of reasons why undercapitalization can kill you. It can kill you in competition. It can kill you on pivots. It can kill you on market risks. Um, it can kill you on... Uh, like literally actually kind of goes on, those are the major ones. But in those cases, if you can raise money at kind of you know, reasonable terms, and reasonable terms doesn't necessarily mean you know, nosebleed valuations and everything else, that seconds. capital can help you navigate appropriately. And so I am one of those uh, investors and entrepreneurs 
who tends to advise uh, uh, entrepreneurs to say, raise more money than you think you need to be ready for all those things, everything from competition to pivots to uh, questions of sudden uh, exploiting opportunities. Uh, moving on to jobs, and we're moving along very quickly. I, I built in a lot of time for you guys to go over, but you've been very disciplined. So we'll go back for an open round okay. after the three topics. We've gone through them uh, the first time. Uh, the Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. One minute for your response. That's right. I, I almost forgot. About that. I, I, I was wondering what I was sort of yeah. kind of scratch my head. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. no. Uh, uh, two reasons why you shouldn't raise more money than you think you need. Uh, I agree with every one of those things that uh, Reed says is true. But it's also true that if you raise more money than you need, you might find that you didn't need it and you diluted yourself way more than you needed to. Now, absolutely, there are many companies that have failed because they did not raise enough money. But there are many companies that appear to have succeeded. They were a huge exit, and the founder didn't get very much of it. And I actually, I actually laugh because I talked with uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg's uh, vice chairman once, and uh, he, he said to me, you know, Mike's always uh, ribbing uh, Larry and Sergey, say, why aren't you guys much richer? You know, because <laughs> Mike basically, you know, self-funded his company. You know, it's like he owns all of it. So even though it had much less of an impact and much less scale than, uh, than Google, he's as rich as they are, right? You know, and so th there's a point about that control. There's also exactly. another point, which is, who gets funded? Who gets funded in this blitz scale? It tends to be uh, aggressive bros. And you know, one of the things that we're proudest at, about at NDVC of, uh, of the 13 companies we've funded so far in this project out of O'Reilly Alphatech Ventures, seven of the 13 are women, two of them African American. And that's amazing because Bryce is, set, is, is finding entrepreneurs who aren't playing that hyperscale game, although actually some of them are turning out to be incredibly successful. Mm. All right, thank you. And moving on to the topic of jobs, and we will revisit some of these points during our, our extra time at, at the end. Reed, first question to you. We've all heard the stats about small business creating the vast majority of jobs, though economists really say it has more to do with the companies being young than necessarily being small. Uh, and scale businesses seem to often result in job loss, even as they, either as they scale up and, and find efficiencies and, and lay people off as they uh, buy other businesses, or Walmart style, as they perhaps drive other businesses out of business. Why is hyperscaling actually good for everybody in the economy versus just the investors and entrepreneurs who help to build the hyperscale businesses? Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's not guaranteed that it's always good on those jobs things, but I think it can be, right? So, so one is, uh, you know, scale businesses. There's this term uh, in a lot of business schools and everything else called high impact entrepreneurship, which is the scale businesses that hire a lot of people actually do provide a bulk of employment. So scale business is very good. Now, when you specifically get to tech businesses, and this is one of the things that Tim and I agree on, is you're essentially creating platforms by which those platforms can create a lot of other generativity. So for example, one of the things that Airbnb uh, launched last year was Magical Trips, which is you can turn any tourist destination into, any destination into a tourist destination. So like Detroit, you can do um, you know, tours of the art scene, you can do tours of the urban farming, you can do other kinds of things and enables uh, entrepreneurial activity on top of it. And I think one of the things that we want in these hyperscale businesses is we'd like to uh, help nudge them and encourage them and shape them and anything else to being those generative platforms, right? Where those generative platforms also allow a bunch of other businesses. And, um, and you know, the, the universe is, it's not just going to be all huge businesses. There's gonna be huge businesses and small businesses and you want them to be as productive on job creation as possible. Now, one of the challenges will be is we have translocation of jobs. Like take, for example, autonomous vehicles, which are coming. You say, well, we've got millions of people driving. What are they going to do? How are you going to make that happen? Well, you would like to actually have educational businesses at scale that are helping reskilling. LinkedIn thinks about this with Linda and other kinds of things in order to help with that. But then the thought is when you create autonomous vehicles, maybe that will be a platform for new kinds of jobs. Like, for example, when cars were created, we had suburbs. We had new other urban areas that could all essentially collaborate. And those urban areas essentially then create uh, new areas of industry and new, new job prospects is what they're doing. And so that's the kind of range at which you think about how these kind of hyperscale companies, like for example, an autonomous vehicle company or autonomous vehicle technology is likely to be that, could facilitate 
a bunch of other jobs. All right, right on time. Uh, Tim, your response. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I agree 100% with, with Reed on this one. And the thing that's super important to understand, first of all, uh, there are ways that we can understand these hyperscale businesses and understand what if the goal is job creation, you'll do things a little bit differently. So for example, take the, the move from uh, Uber and Lyft towards self-driving cars. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about jobs, you will say, oh wait, we want to actually build interoperability into self-driving cars so that individuals, not just the platform, can own the cars and supply them to the service. So Uber or Lyft would become more like Airbnb. You would say, oh, wait, that's a strategic choice we can make that will make this more generative as a platform rather than extractive as a platform. Okay, we're going to take, you know, the, the narrative is, well, we're going to, these companies will now get to take more of the profits, get rid of the drivers. 15 seconds. And the narrative should be, no, we're going to actually create new opportunities for people to build new businesses on top of our platform. We are a generative platform, and that's what we as an industry have got to start thinking, and we've got to start preaching if we're really going to actually contribute in a positive way to the future of the economy in this country and this world. All right. <laughs> Agreement. Uh, Tim, the next question on jobs goes to you. MailChimp is an example of a company that scaled without VC backing. It's now among the leaders in the newsletter space. You mentioned Bloomberg uh, as being another, though not my favorite broadcast and data company, still a very significant <laughs> one <laughs> that employs uh, quite a few people. Do you agree or disagree that carefully scaled, slowly scaled businesses can be job leaders, given the fact that you've got a, a couple that have a pretty decent sized workforces. Absolutely. Uh, and actually, one of the things that I think Bryce has done really brilliantly in NDVC is to create an investment vehicle uh, that actually supports uh, the choice of founders to go either way. Uh, basically, the NDVC investment is in the form of a convertible note uh, which actually is paid back in dividends if the if the uh, basically the it isn't a hyperscale exit aim business but something that just continues when the founders start to pay themselves more than uh, above market rates or pay dividends they also pay dividends out to to the investor on the other hand if they say whoa this is a I'm on a rocket ship I want to now go to blitz scale take in VC money then it's it's convertible in, into regular equity and I think that's a way of giving the control to the entrepreneur, uh, where you're giving them some seed capital to, you know, to build out their business to, to, to get going, uh, but you're not forcing them to exit. Because that's the other real problem with the current Silicon Valley uh, model. You either become a really successful giant, or after a few years, the VCs are done with you, and they just want you to be off their, you know, uh, you know out of their, their fund, because, hey, 15 seconds. Uh, they don't have time. And, and we want businesses to stick around, and there are a lot of great businesses that can stick around. All right, thank you. Reed, your response. Are well, there any startups that you don't want around anymore that you're sweeping out this week? Well, I was going to say that that's the difference between bad VCs and good VCs. And just like anything in humanity, there's both good and bad. Um, I think uh, it is important as, as venture to be uh, uh, founder-centered and partnering with the founders in terms of realizing a, a good uh, outcome for the business, which is for uh, shareholders, for the employees, for the customers, for the ecosystem, is all very important. And I think the, uh, that uh, there are many great VCs, of which I think Greylock is obviously one of them in, in a, you know, kind of a personal subjective judgment kind of way. Uh, <laughs> I think it, so too. Yeah. So I'll, I'll validate okay. that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, are those ones who go long term and focus on what is the right uh, outcome across all of these? Now, there are kind of structural challenges where you tend to say the, uh, when you're only maximizing a dollar shareholder return, that can sometimes under-deliver uh, patience or long-term returns. And that's one of the things you actually have to work on. And that's one of the things to pay attention to. And as usually, I think that's kind of intelligence, culture, and so forth. And there will always be some folks who don't, who don't do it that way. 15 seconds. What I do think is, is particularly important in tracking the, the scale question here is, Scale businesses can create a uh, you know, number of jobs. You know, uh, LinkedIn's over 10,000 uh, people now. And one of the things you have to really pay attention to this is if you're competing with blitzscale competitors, that'll make your outcome if you're not blitzscaling 
much more in doubt. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the reasons why it's really important to pay attention to. And that will happen more often and more often in tech businesses, and then more businesses are becoming tech businesses. All right, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to make a closing argument. Uh, Tim, since you went second uh, with the first question, you will actually get to close at the very end and, and make your point uh, the last point. I'm basically just talking a little bit to give you a little time to figure out what, what you're going to start to say. We've covered three topics, uh, the power of scale, the money of scale, uh, the jobs behind scale, and perhaps after these closing arguments, we'll get to revisit a couple of the points uh, along the way that we made as well. Read your closing argument. <clears throat> so broad brush, there are uh, blitz scale businesses and scale businesses and also a variety of small businesses. And it's super important that we are focused as a tech industry and as an investment industry on creation of uh, economies and jobs as a way to make this happen. This is what we agree on. The key thing that I think uh, tends to be where, where, where Tim and I have a, a kind of a strong difference of angle is that I tend to focus on what are the next platforms because the platforms then determine all the downstream. They, depend, they, they determine the, the number of different kind of micro entrepreneurs who can build on top of them. They, depend, they, they determined the uh, society level scale of the economics. Uh, they determine the, uh, the kinds of things that um, will actually be the future progress events. It's like the policies that these platform companies and the shape of them and what they are doing uh, matters a lot more in the overall course of humanity. And so that's the reason why I tend to focus on that. I don't disagree that someone who says, look, I don't really have a chance of blitz scaling business. I'm just gonna you know, throw myself at the wall, maybe get acquired. That's an unwise choice. But the more of these key platforms that unlock the platforms of generativity within our business, the better off we are. Thank you, Reed. Tim, your closing argument. Yeah. I, I, I actually, I can't help but uh, respond a little bit to what Reed just said first, and that is, uh, it's not just the platforms that raise a lot of money that have big impact. Tim Berners-Lee didn't raise a whole lot of money, neither did Vince Cerf. Uh, all the internet stuff that we were all enjoying uh, was built on top of something that was given as a gift to the world. Uh, and I look at my own business where the impact that we had uh, was far larger than the revenue of our company. Uh, yeah, we coined uh, the, our slogan, create more value than you capture, after I was uh, talking at a company retreat in 2000 about how a number of internet billionaires had told me that they'd started their company with an O'Reilly book. You know, I said, yeah, we got 35 bucks, they got a few billion. <laughs> you know, that's a good trade because they built something wonderful. And uh, you know, so I, I, I've always loved open source software and the gift that we can give each other in the economy. And the idea, I. While I totally agree that it takes capital to scale some businesses, and I, I love it when I see businesses that are doing it right. You know, Elon Musk is using capital markets the way they were meant to be used, which is here's this really hard big thing, uh, you know, which is holy shit, uh, you know, it might not happen, but if it happens, it's really good for the world and it's going to be really good for you as investors, so come on in. A lot of the Silicon Valley uh, investments that I hear about are not of that kind. They are basically, hey, let's create this company that maybe somebody will acquire. They're not necessarily vision driven. Now again, obviously, Reed, a good VC doesn't invest in those, but you have to admit that an awful lot of, your, uh, of the other Silicon Valley VCs do, do invest in them. Not only that, most of those companies fail, but the VCs do just fine because they've raised a big fund, they have a nice uh, you know, annual payout, and they make a lot of money whether or not the investors succeed or not. I mean, whether or not the investors succeed, whether or not the entrepreneurs succeed. 15 seconds. And, and what's so interesting there, in that model, your typical, sil your, your, many of your Silicon Valley entrepreneurs look a lot more like directors and actors going hat in hand to Hollywood studios than they do look like true entrepreneurs. Thank you, Tim. Uh, that concludes the closing arguments in this portion. We won't actually score the debate personally. Each of you can do that uh, on an individual basis. We've got a couple minutes, and, and I want to revisit one interesting topic uh, in particular that got a response from the audience. Tim, when it came to money, you mentioned that the structure of your venture organization you believe is a benefit to diversity. Uh, ethnically, 
uh, gender-wise. Say more about that. Why do you think that is? Well, I think a lot of it is uh, because many of the opportunities uh, that, well, first of all, there's, there's kind of a, uh, a lack of diversity in the investment community, which is reflected in, in the kinds of opportunities that they want to pursue. I think there's also uh, uh, you know, this very idea that the only things that are really worth going for are the unicorns, and that's what will make your fund and nothing else matters, leads you to filter out a lot of things uh, that are, are very, very worthwhile businesses. And so when you actually are saying, no, we want to build a business that can survive on its own terms, where the founder is doing something that's funded by customers, uh, they're delivering real value at whatever scale, whether it starts small and stays small, or whether it grows. I mean, there are companies like uh, uh, Basecamp, which has grown uh, fairly substantially. But basically, the founder said, we never want to be more than 50 employees. We're going to limit our growth. And they basically you know, take out a lot of money in, in uh, dividends for the founders. And they're the size they want to be. Mm -hmm. Or companies that get really large. These are all opportunities. Uh, but if you start with, we support all of these things, you'll look at a much wider range of opportunities, a much wider range of businesses, and a much wider range of founders. And then what we try to do is to create an environment where those founders what we're giving them is not money. It's really the network as much as anything. Uh, there's a great quote. Uh, I wish I had it in my mind in one of Bryce's posts. Um, uh, follow Bryce on strong words on Medium, and you'll, you'll see these great posts. But one of his founders uh, uh, was saying how great it was to come to the first NDVC meeting. And oh my gosh, not only was she you know, a, a black woman getting a seat at the table, but there was another one just like her there and how affirming that felt. To, and then, but then it was like, and we were all founders together. Mm. And it wasn't like, well, you're a founder of a little company. You're the, you know, the one who has the, you know, the, the big values. So I, I think you know, really trying to nurture, uh, you know, we need small businesses. They are what actually makes our communities great. You know? and, and the fact is, if, if all we had were blitz scale businesses, we'd live in a pretty sterile world. I want yeah. to get Reed's uh, thoughts on how structural changes, advancements, experiments uh, in investing in VC might lead to a greater diversity of voices and perspectives in the businesses that get funded and succeed. So um, three things. So first is there's clearly a problem of diversity within the uh, venture and investing community. It's just obvious. Anyone with two eyes and two neurons to rub together can see that. Um, and that does create some biases in investment, and it does create, uh, and then also then for contributes to what people usually complain all about in the pipeline issue because it's a little bit self-reinforcing. So you have to try as best you can to change all that. In the last few months, we've had obviously a lot of attention on that within gender, which is good uh, because of uh, the misbehavior of some particular uh, male VCs. And, um, but it's also important on, on race and among the brothers, which are all huge areas. That's one of the reasons, and the second point is, one of the things that I was trying to highlight with that is that many great ideas don't necessarily look uh, great in the beginning. And part of a substantive idea is to actually, in fact, be contrarian, where relatively few people think it's good. And that's part of the reason why on the Master of Scale podcast, Beauty of a Bad Idea, with Tristan Walker of Walker and & Company and Bevel, was precisely highlighting this kind of issue where you know, all of these uh, folks who didn't actually grok the problem didn't realize that this was a really interesting problem. And that actually turns out to be an advantage for the VCs that do, an advantage for the entrepreneurs that can then exploit that opportunity as long as they can get going down the, the path. And that was part of highlighting to use the contrarianness to an advantage. Now, I think structurally what we want to do to fix this, you know, it's pretty straightforward, and, and part of the um, the thing is, is if you think we have a problem, which you should, two eyes, two brain cells, <laughs> right, uh, you should say, OK, how do I help uh, get more people into the venture community? How do I help more entrepreneurs uh, uh, prospectively become successful entrepreneurs that incorporate the diversity that makes much more talent, many more good ideas, many more products to the market? Uh, and then you know, what, am, what am I actually inve uh, investing my time and energy and money in in order to help make that future happen? And you should always be asking yourself that question every week doing it, whether you're an individual or a, or a um, uh, society 
uh, or a venture firm doing that. And that's what I think is uh, an important part of doing that. Now the very last plug that I will say on the scaling thing is it's not only important that we have the whole diversity around essentially the, the small businesses or the, the kind of the, 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 the growing with limited capital businesses, but also on the blitz scale businesses. So it's important we do that there too. Well, thanks to both of you, Tim, Reed, this is a debate that I feel like the audience have, has won, uh, and the moderator as well, just getting to be a part of it. I uh, appreciate that. I also want to uh, finally remind the audience of Tim's book coming out, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us, Reed's podcast, Masters of Scale. My own podcast, Fort Knox, uh, which also features Tristan Walker in episode 39. You get to hear a little bit about his upbringing and, and how perhaps he's not the typical Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Thanks to our viewers on LinkedIn watching this recorded. Also, our viewers live on CNBC.com, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. And once again, audience, thanks to you. <laughs>